Hello everyone, my name is Jessica Girk. I'm the PR Director here at Helen Woodward Animal Center and I am so excited to welcome you all to today's panel discussion, Animals in Graphic Novels, Games and Comics. Helen Woodward Animal Center has been around since 1972 and we have over 14 unique programs and campaigns all dedicated towards the mission of people helping animals, animals helping people with a primary focus on rescue. And for the last eight years, Helen Woodward Animal Center has celebrated the superhero action of adopters who rescue orphan pets in a pop culture themed cosplay costume event that we titled Pomicon. In 2019, we broadened the event because the kind people at the Comic-Con Museum welcomed us to do our event over there. And this year, we are so excited that the Comic-Con people, the wonderful people at Comic-Con, have selected our topic to be part of their big Comic-Con virtual panel. So today, I'm excited to speak to some of the most incredible creators who honor animals in their work every single day. I'm going to introduce them and let them do this panel. First, we have Keith Aram, who is a writer, director, producer, and the CEO and president of Los Angeles-based PCB Productions. He is a multi-platform storyteller. I see his puppy there. He has a successful career in video games, interactive media, music, graphic novels, animation, motion pictures, television, and augmented virtual reality. And he has three dogs at home and he told us he's looking at another at a fourth so he has our heart too and then we have Chris Ryle who's a partner of Syzygy Publishing he was the former president and publisher and chief creative officer at IDW Publishing as well as an award-winning editor and Eisner nominated writer of dozens of comic series including his co-creations Zombies and Robots which is in development at Sony Pictures Groom Lake The Colonized The Hollows and more and in September 2019, Chris adopted a six-year-old one-eyed pug from the Humane Society <laughs> sitting with him right there. That's Morty. And Chris tells us that Morty is the Robin to his Batman, the Bucky to his Captain America, and the Rick Jones wow. to his Hulk. Hulk. Nice. So we <laughs> love and understand that sort of feeling for our animals. And finally, I'm very pleased to introduce our host who will be uh, leading this panel discussion, Robert Rice, who is the CEO of Transmira, the developer of Omniscape, which was the first XR platform to blend augmented and virtual reality together with a focus on location and, mon and monetization. He is the chief architect and designer for Omniscape. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. Okay. And I'm going to pass this over to Robert Rice so he can lead this wonderful panel discussion. Cool. All right. Uh, awesome. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure seeing you again, uh, Keith and Chris. Um, there we go. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm really, really excited about this panel. I uh, really enjoyed uh, talking working with you guys last year. And uh, I'm really pleased that um, uh, you know, Helen Woodward uh, has invited us uh, back again for this. I think it's going to be great. Uh, so again, thank you. I hope you guys are doing well and survived uh, you know, horrible COVID from last year. How are you guys doing? I think we're just going to erase last year, just consider it like a leap year and just erase it from the history books. I think we'll just get a year older, erase it, and then just move on. <laughs> yeah, but good. Happy to happy to chat with both of you again. Very Fantastic. cool. All right. Well, uh, well, let's get started. So let's um, let's get a couple of kind of basic things out of the way uh, and then kind of dive into some of the more uh, more interesting topics. So for for starters, um, let's uh, let's talk about real quickly. What, what do you guys do? And kind of how do you handle a new client or a new property, uh, you know, when it when it first um, comes your way? Um, Keith, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, our business is kind of split into two different sides. Uh, we have client services where we're working. We're uh, working on video game properties, motion pictures, other uh, projects where we have a client that will come in and introduce a property. And then whether writing or producing or mainly directing, uh, then it's our responsibility to really understand what that property entails, what the franchise is about, and then how we integrate and organize and then direct uh, the creative performances on those projects. And then the other half of our company is all original projects. So that's our graphic novels, movies, or television shows, um, and our original games. And that's a much different thing because the client is ourselves. So we have to answer to a different set of rules and a different set of expectations. And, um, and so, yeah, I think the idea is to really, you know, when you are working with an outside client is to immerse yourself 
in the needs of that project from a, a creative standpoint and from a technical standpoint. And you have to break that down and look at what that project needs uh, to execute the project well, especially when we're working in video games. Uh, we're mainly working with uh, celebrities and actors and executing cinematic storylines. So we have to understand uh, not only the mythology in the world, but also the characters and the actors and how that's going to be cast properly. And then to execute those performances, whether we're doing voiceover or we're doing motion capture or, or facial capture and integrating that into that. So for us, it's a every day, every project is a new kind of experience and a new challenge. And uh, we love it. It's just a, it's a great world to be in. And uh, that's how we always look at our projects about breaking them down. And for our, our own projects, um, it's just a set, uh, the same discipline of being able to take your own creative ideas, break them down and be able to execute them and get them finished so they don't just set, stack up on a pile of unused ideas that never get executed because you're always working for somebody else. Right, right. Awesome. Chris? Yeah, you know, it's very similar. Um, it's similar, although very different for me personally, because I was at IDW for about 16 years and it was a company that grew to be about 70 people on the publishing side. And so I was used to having this, this fully developed infrastructure and staff around me. And so I left there last summer and in the meantime have been building a new publishing venture that hasn't quite launched officially yet, but, but you know, we've been building that over a couple months, a partner and I, um, well, over about the last six, eight months. And so along with, with that is, is sort of like Keith was saying, some of it is our own projects, things that we're developing that are our own ideas and that we're looking to bring to life. But along with that is taking in ideas from other people, whether they are, you know, new creator projects that just a creator and an artist have put together, or in a couple cases, um, taking work from from sort of bigger companies that want to have graphic novel projects based on their product or their film or their game. And so in those cases, it is very much what Keith was saying, which is immersing yourself in what their property is, what the story they want to tell is, who the audience they want to reach and sort of finding the best ways to distill all of that into a compelling graphic novel project. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's a matter of sort of doing what I did in the past, but now doing it with much less support around me. So it's, it's been interesting because it's sort of back to my roots of just making comics, um, you know, with just one or two people and sort of trying to figure out then how to launch those, market those and elevate those in the best ways possible. So, so it sounds like both of you do do a lot when somebody comes to you and say, hey, you know, we've got an idea, we've got a property, we've got a character, maybe we already have something that's, you know, fully fleshed out, what, where do we go next? And you kind of take them to the next stage. So it's okay, here's how we can do traditional, you know, print publishing, here's how we can do interactive media, here's how we can kind of help you grow into you know, other types of media. I mean, is that is that pretty much the case where you're both like this full service it's not just, yeah, give us your thing and we're going to print it, but it's like, no, we're going to got to get immersed and really have to flesh this out and kind of take you the best path to market. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, it's sort of a twofold thing because on one side, you want to make sure that if the client is bringing you this thing and hiring you to develop their property, um, you want them to be satisfied with the service you're providing. But the other part, other part of it is just from a personal perspective, you live with these things for much longer than you you might be initially think. And so if you don't like it, if you don't respond to it, if it's not a thing that you find compelling, then it just feels a lot like work. And so, you know, you want to find, you want to find the best way into these properties to where both sides can feel creatively satisfied and sort of make sure that you're hitting whatever the deliverables may be. But then, you know, for me personally, to feel like it's a thing that I respond to well enough where it's not just taking on a job, but it's, it's really, bringing everything I have and everything I've done in this business to bear to, to sort of deliver on and hopefully exceed whatever expectations the client may have. Yeah, it's, it's interesting for myself because I'm also, you know, very much, I consider myself a storyteller. And so when I'm telling a story, whether it's writing or directing and creating a project, there's usually, you know, I love collaborating, but there's also that creative singular focus of of channeling that idea and, and sharing that creativity with your team and, and bringing something out. When you are a full service company, when you're doing production services and you're recording or, or on set, you know, bringing together actors and, and working with all the different uh, elements to bring together a production, um, that 
that also has to be creatively rewarding on some level, right, for your team and making sure that everyone is engaged there. So, so I kind of play the, the, the role of, of the director, writer, creator on one side, but really, you know, on the production services, I'm also a very much a producer and a facilitator. And, uh, and I think for me, that's the, a nice balance because I can do the work and do the job that I need to be do, uh, doing, but then also be creatively fulfilled to be able to execute my own side of things. And so I get that balance. So I'm not burning out too much on just doing the creative and I'm not burning out too much just doing the work and I can go back and forth. And fortunately we're a small enough company that we can do that. And we've, but we still inject ourselves into much bigger franchises and still be able to direct and, and uh, creatively guide those projects. Yeah. Uh, but that, that's awesome. Uh, so just for a point of clarification, uh, Chris, can you give us a basic uh, kind of a definition of, of a graphic novel and how it differs from a comic book? Yeah, I mean, it differs only in that, that some people want to uh, sort of try to elevate the medium into something more lofty sounding, so they call comics graphic novels. But essentially, a graphic novel is is a thicker comic book. Um, uh, you know, there's otherwise no real delineation between people in the business. You know, we're completely fine calling them comic books. Some people want to only call them graphic novels because it, it like I say, it makes it feel more like somehow literature or something. But Really a graphic novel to us is something that's got a spine to it that, you know, is stocked in a mass market bookstore like a Barnes and Noble or something like that. But comic books and graphic novels are largely just interchangeable terms. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So, so given the, you know, the, the topic here is, is, is clearly, you know, um, animals and media and all these other sort of topics. How often do you see animals uh, being incorporated in, in storylines that you guys work on? Uh, and more importantly, you know, how often are they like substantial and not just, um, uh, you know, background scenery? Uh, Combination. You, wanna, you, you see, I think you see animals represented in a variety of different ways in media and, and always have been in, in films and especially in genre pieces. Um, animals play a very strong symbolic role because on one side uh, they represent humanity itself and an and innocent version of ourselves. And they've always been used in so many different aspects of life that when they are personified in a film or in a comic or in a game, um, they usually have that symbolic uh, sort of metaphor for what's going on uh, with the story. And uh, it, it happens in games and graphic novels and films. I think you know you see them used um, sometimes as characters and sometimes as a device to further the narrative. Um, you know, it's interesting. You see a film like I Am Legend, and you have this dog that becomes his companion, and you you form a bond with his dog. You know, more so I think than even him in the in the you know in the last Will Smith film, like when the dog you know spoiler you know gets you know, killed, you, it is a tragic turning point in the film for the audience because you've bonded with a character that obviously has no speech. And so I think as you're seeing uh, animals being represented in, in media, especially entertainment, um, we really do identify with them and not just as animals, but our pets and our families. Chris? Yeah, I mean, certainly in comic books, like animals sort of go back to the earliest days of the comic book world. Um, Something like these, this comic cavalcade, you know, used just funny animals were were sort of prevalent in the comic book form before even uh, costume superheroes. Um, and then all along the way, they've either stood in for for human characters, like in the form of I don't know the Ninja Turtles or Howard the Duck, that kind of thing, or they have been used to sort of allow more real world stories be presented to people in ways that are potentially a bit more palatable in something like like there's a book called Mouse. It's a famous graphic novel by Art Spiegelman. And it basically portrays the horrors of the Holocaust through cats and mice. And I think what that does is it allows a broader readership to sort of read these very disturbing, horrific events, but not necessarily see, see the humans, you know, portrayed in, in those ways. And so it allows, you know, a younger reader to understand what went on in, in this historically horrible, you know, event, but not, uh, you know, portray them through animals. And so in some ways they're standards for humanity. In other ways they do, like Keith was saying, they just humanize the human characters. And so you'll see sidekicks or you'll see something like, I don't know, Cujo or Old Yeller where a pet starts out one way and then it's sort of becomes a different element in the story that 
you do find grouping because animals always have this this even if they're wild animals they have this kind of pureness or innocence to them in that they're only they're only seen through their own instincts they're not humans that have sort of deceitful tendencies or whatever else humans have. And so you never want anything bad to happen to the animals. Um, and so they they sort of function all these different ways as storytelling devices, even going so far as to just being used as a cheat in something like a horror movie where you'll hear suspenseful music and you think something bad's going to happen. And then it's a cat being thrown or jumping through a window or something like that. And so they're used from anything from from shock techniques like that to, like Keith says, you know, really, really helping you bond with the character or sort of experience that character's humanity even more because any human character that cares about animals is kind of a more worthwhile person than a, a you know as animal lovers i think we all realize that uh you know people that that have a a fondness or a love of animals are just better people um <laughs> and so so animals kind of help bring that out yeah i think when you personify a story using animals because like even like your examples you know with mouse you know look at like animal farm or charlotte's web i mean they really teach adults a lesson about life and about humanity by looking at it through the eyes of of an animal right and even uh, uh you know you look at lion king which has this shakespearean type story underneath it and, and it's very much you know a family movie or 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 story that's there but if you really look at the underlying drama that's there it's really it's just us right but the animals are taking the place of us and it allows us to then look at it a little bit in a in a different light and we don't realize necessarily right away that it's ourselves and once we apply that to ourselves then it becomes a much more the moral of the story becomes much more obvious even when you look at things like like superhero comics where spider-man almost for the first five years or so of spider-man's existence almost every villain he fought had an animal-based power you know, there was the lizard, there was the rhino, there was Dr. Octopus, there was the vulture. And so it, it was, it's very easy to sort of take the abilities that animals have, flight or, you know, being able to swim or breathe underwater or all the different things that animals can do. And laying that power onto a human makes, makes for very easy superhuman development as well. Hmm. So, so, so this is interesting. Um, so it sounds like, you know, obviously animals can be, you know, the background part of the scenery. Uh, they can help humanize, uh, you know, main characters and provide context or make things easier. They can replace humans. We can humanize them, anthropomorphize, them, whatever, um, to make storytelling easier. Um, but, but, but as powerful as all this is, I think when, when you look back over, over time in history, you know, humans have have this really weird, uh, you know, identification uh, with animals so much so that you know you can see like you know military units you know the wolves of this or the tigers of that or dragons or whatever or you know uh, coats of arms for for different you know nobility or even like even america right we, we have the, the the bald eagles as our national symbol um you, you, why do, why do you think we we as humans rely on or, or or attribute such importance to animals animal attributes or identifying with animals or using them in our storytelling why why animals why not different types of plants or flowers you know what what, what is the power and the magnet the, the magnetism of, of using animals for these things i mean part of it i think is just the, the majesty of seeing an animal sort of exhibiting its traits you know you see an eagle soaring through the air you see a lion roaring and it, it's sort of these these I don't know, just majestic traits that humans aren't capable of. And so it's sort of the thing we aspire to, like a lion is seen as just this regal, powerful animal, which I think is how humans would love to see themselves, especially through, you know, military or coats of arms, that kind of thing. There's often a lion portraying, you know, strength and power. Um, the eagle is portraying, uh, you know, whatever those traits are, freedom or, or whatever else, you know, you ascribe to the animal. And I think there's a certain aspect of it to, uh, where we we kind of aspire to those those traits that these animals have or that we at least subscribe to those animals and i think that those animals describe a singular trait i mean even though they obviously represent all sorts of different things in life when someone talks about their power animal or some way that they see themselves you know when you see is how animals have been used 
uh, as you said earlier, you know, you've got horses or elephants or mules or camels, and they're used for transportation or for fighting, uh, or a pigeon is always associated with carrying a message or, you know, animals or detect, you know, dogs are detecting mines or used for certain things. And so I think that we start to attribute like like Chris was saying, you know, the, the, the sense of freedom from an eagle or the power of a lion or the speed of a cheetah, you know, those singular traits, we adopt each of those within our life. And so that animal then represents that value that we put, um, you know, that we treasure and we focus on. And if, and if it's a wild animal uh, that's uncontained, that's got that spirit of there, or it's a domesticated animal that becomes part of our family, and then we relate to that. So, so, so do we as storytellers cheat sometimes by just, you know, grabbing the nearest animal and its tribute and sticking it in a story? Or does it end up being more often like actually impactful and, and meaningful? I mean, look at, I mean, look at even the animal associations in Game of Thrones. I mean, very easily identifiable, very well suited to the characters, uh, and, and it made sense. It, it fit the narrative. You didn't stop to think, oh, well, that doesn't make any sense for that guy to be associated with that kind of animal. It was like, you know, like, I'm all in on, you know, winter's coming and you know, let's go with the wolves here. It's very easy. Yeah, to I guess use. I guess it. Oh, oh, yeah, go go for it. Oh, I was just gonna say it sort of depends on the story you're telling, right? Like it's something like like Zootopia, where where we all know that at least this the stereotype of the DMV worker that they're very <laughs> slow. And so you grab a sloth who's known for being very slow and it's funny to kids who maybe don't have that terrible DMV experience um, to just see an animal moving very slowly. And it, it's comedic for them, but then for an adult, it functions on a different level where you go, oh, yeah, that, that slow animal is very similar to it's the stereotypical DMV worker, that kind of thing. And so you can use it certainly to a humorous effect, um, but then like in something like Game of Thrones or I don't know, even in an animated movie like Secret Life of Pets where you can take a, the primary thing that a certain animal, a cat or a dog is known for and play that up in their personality and it becomes immediately recognizable. So it's it's sort of a shorthand or a nice easy way into a character. And it's also, a, 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 I think in some respects, some uh, writers can use it as a crutch uh, and sometimes to the detriment of the animal. I mean, if you think obviously a classic movie like Jaws, you know, here you have this gigantic, majestic animal that is vilified as this man eater, right? Which they are, but so unstoppable that, you know, you've now terrified a generation of people from going into the ocean and having respect for these animals, but also I think vilifying them to the point that you see, you know, them being overfished and being vilified where they're used as a sense of strength but also as something that, uh, you know, you see what's happened with finning and, and other things where the shark populations have decreased and we turn a blind eye to it because we're sort of trained through the media and entertainment that sharks are bad. And we've seen a number of films that have continued that trait. Um, and so I think we have some responsibility, right, as, as storytellers to understand that, that impact of what we do to society as we use them as devices in our stories. Yeah, although I would have to argue that the uh, Baby Shark song really kind of smoothed all that over. <laughs> no, I'm not going to sing it. Um, okay, well, that's cool. I, I found that really interesting. Um, so, so, so two other questions. How often do you see uh, animals being central or thematic to a storyline, A, and then B, do you see them appearing uh, more often in, in, in a particular type of media? You know, again, you know, comic book, graphic novel, games, uh, you know, video, streaming movies. I mean, is there, is there, is there like one channel that tends to have more an animal related stuff or is it pretty much just even these days? I mean, I think in animation, certainly there's a preponderance of animals because it's, it's a lot easier to get kids to want to watch something that has animals in it rather than trying to make sure you, you hit their exact preferred age that they like to watch. Or, you know, if you have something that's to adults, like kids aren't going to want to watch it. And similarly, you can you can make an animal and their personality more universal. Where, you know, sometimes some media was aimed too much at a certain race or person that that others couldn't find their easy way into. And so, animals I think are a more universally, uh, I don't know, broadly fun audience for or or figure for kids to be able to relate to and sort of get into the stories early on. Um, and you also then can just tell fun stories for kids who maybe don't want 
the sort of added complications or shadings that that human characters have. You know, it's certainly when when kids start dating or you know, there's there becomes sort of I don't know more adult complications encroaching on their story. Animals keep it a bit more pure in that way, and so I think animation will probably always have a heavy animal uh, presence. Um, comic books, you know, I've seen that throughout the decades as well, where you can you can either play up traits or you can sort of play against type. Where a Ninja Turtle, you know, turtles are slow, and you know, in in real life, they're certainly not action figures, and then you <laughs> see them in the Ninja Turtles comic. And they are, and their shell is a built-in perfect defense. And so I think in, in those forms, it certainly makes a lot of sense. Well, and everyone also knows from a production standpoint that animals are amazingly adorable, but they're so difficult to work with on camera. <laughs> so I think that you know over the years, um, animals have been replaced with uh, animatronic or CG creatures, right? And that's always been uh, a stumbling block for, for film. Uh, whereas in animation where uh, digital humans and creating a realistic human character has been also challenging. Doing a CG animal is a lot more entertaining, a lot more forgiving. And so I think that allowed animation to sort of lead um, a lot of their stories using animals in that place. And if you look at all the early Pixar movies and all the other CG films that have come out, they've primarily been animal based just because of that. And uh, Disney, I think, you know, in, in terms of all their normal uh, 2D animated films also finds that animals, when they're personified that way, really uh, attract that audience. People for a long time, I think, have associated comic books with animation. And as comic books and graphic novels especially have become much more mature and attracted a much older audience, um, that's where I thought I think you started to see things like Mouse and these other books where they were coming out of that generation where they were using sort of the cute characters or sort of the cartoon-like uh, animal characters, but then personified into a very adult uh, character, Rocket Raccoon, you know, in Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, you get a character that's very irreverent, uh, who speaks like a human, but is still an animal and, and then fights their nature, right? And so I think that you have a generation now that have, has all grown up with animation, with gaming, with comic books, but we're all adults now and we still have that childhood uh, attachment to animals, but we also want to tell very mature stories. So that's why you'll see them both portrayed that way, or they'll be vilified in other ways. If you look at like, you know, uh, Quiet Place 2 that just came out this week, uh, really terrifying movie. These are, you know, alien creatures that are uh, very animalistic in their nature because they don't communicate the same way. They move differently, but very animal based. And, uh, and I think that when you see films like Planet of the Apes, uh, or other films where you're taking animals that are very much portrayed as humans, um, that almost becomes more terrifying to us because they have all those traits we talked about, um, but they have the intelligence of a human. And that, I think, from a, uh, an adult perspective is, is much more, I don't want to say just terrifying, but it's much more engaging because you're not just thinking about a children's animated uh, product. Now you're talking about a story that's dealing with very mature subject with uh, an animal that may have a singular focus that is better than anything that you, you know, own yourself. And, you know, Rob, you asked earlier why animals and why not plants? And speaking of Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, Groot. Groot and the popularity of Groot certainly might start paving the way for more, you know, plant-based creatures. Yeah, I mean that, that would that would make sense. I mean, even you know here 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 uh, you know where I live in Raleigh, it's, it's the city of oaks, you know, and the oak right. tree symbol, and that that means you know strength and growth and all the other sort of things. So, if yeah, the tree I mean, ants in Lord of the Rings, you know, yeah. what I'm talking about? <laughs> like the I'm, I'm just I'm just glad we haven't really haven't adopted like you know bugs is like the main thing that we all like to go for because you know I hate them all <laughs> and I much prefer animals for sure. <laughs> You're not ready for a cicada on screen yet. <laughs> no, thank God. But, you know, I mean, the first time I heard Brood X, I started thinking, you know, about some old, old, old X-Men stuff. It's like, oh, man, that's the last time we Brood <laughs> come showing around. So. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really old reference for you young people. Um, <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Okay, so, so you, you know, given what you guys are doing in terms of your current projects or maybe just some favorite ones in the past, uh, what would you say is your, your favorite or your most interesting one that you've worked on that had a strong uh, focus on, uh, on animals? I mean, it's always kind of a cheat when somebody says, well, the thing I'm doing currently, but I, uh, I'm working on a thing currently with uh, this artist, Ashley Wood. Um, and it's essentially us trying to take all these things that we liked through 
through sort of our, our childhood love of animal-based um, stories and distill it into a comic book form. And so it's kind of a Richard scary, cute bunny, cute animal kind of project meets uh, Watership Down. And so it's, uh, you know, with some Game of Thrones in there as well. And so it it gets very serious very quickly, but yet you have these these very cute animals, you know, with spears and other weapons, um, you know, and, and a rabbit riding horse on a horse and that kind of thing. And that, so it's, it is really all of us or both of us trying to take all of these different things that we loved as kids, all these different stories with animals in them and sort of synthesize them into something all new at this point. A lot of the projects that I'm producing, we always have some form of an animal incorporated into the story or, or into the mythology that's there. Um, from my personal perspective, I've always taken uh, the, the affection of aliens, uh, mainly because they, they don't symbolize humans per se, but they do have these animalistic traits to do that. So uh, my recent film, Phoenix Incident, you know, we have these very, like that we call them attack dogs, but they're like these vicious uh, creatures that defend a ship. And uh, they actually aren't even the real aliens that are, that are approaching, but there are these things that come out and hunt. And uh, I've always been fascinated by that because, uh, and like what I was mentioning earlier with like A Quiet Place, I just got to see that yesterday. It's really fascinating to kind of have creatures like that that, that can kind of use that to scare audiences. And I was a big fan of Alien and The Thing and a lot of these classic films from the uh, 70s and 80s and 90s. And so to now be making my own films and, and books, um, I love taking that sort of childhood fear of what that was. There was an old film, um, prophecy and it was uh, I, I used to go backpacking and camping uh, with my family and I remember seeing this film as a kid and you know there's some uh toxic mercury runoff that's contaminating the forest and these bears become these this, this one terrible terrible creature and you know you see something like that and you're terrified every time you go camping with your family so that sort of childhood you know fantasy and 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 uh, sort of uh, mythology always st stuck with me. And so a lot of the stories I'm working with kind of bring that back. I did something very similar. I did a graphic novel called Groom Lake and it, it featured a lot of different types of aliens. And I did very much the same thing that people do when they take animals and use them in comics or other media. Um, and that I ascribed kind of a, a, a known personality trait to each of the different types of aliens. And so the gray aliens function in a very different way than the reptilians, than these other sort of different talked about types of aliens that have been prevalent in media. Um, and, and so it was it was very much that same kind of approach of treating them almost in the same way that animals are treated, where you're, you know, just making making them immediately recognizable by these various traits that uh, have kind of become sort of in the pop culture ether. So, so funny you should say aliens. Um, so, so, you know, obviously there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with government reports and whatever coming out and aliens are always a you know perennial favorite for everybody especially for storytelling because it's it's the unknown you know it taps into you know certain fears and it's just it's still it's fertile ground for storytelling uh, but at the same time you know again as storytellers it, i think it's easy to to try to make these things you know understandable or, or recognizable or relatable even if they're you know monsters or creatures by adding, you know, animal or animal animalistic, you know, attributes to make them more interesting or more compelling. But at the end of the day, do we, I mean, is that okay? Or are we, do we end up doing a disservice to, to actual animals? You know, we mentioned you know, Jaws and, you know, Cujo and some of these other ones, um, you know, we, but we live in a time, especially now with COVID where, you know, support animals, you know, are so important for mental health. Uh, or, you know, more and more people are living alone, they're single. Um, and, you know, the, the, the pet industry in and of itself is huge and massive. And a lot of people, you know, rely on, on pets for companionship. And, you know, even, uh, you know, for me and my wife, you know, we treat our, 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 our cat and our, our black lab like our children. You know, if you mess with my, 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 my pets, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess you up. So do you, do you think as an industry or even as, uh, as individual, you know, authors or storytellers, are, are we doing doing well with animals and, and how animals are treated, uh, you know, in the current day moving forward? Are we going overboard a little bit too much on some of our monster creations? I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, it's just like, it's open-ended sort of question. Animals are really, you know, very, obviously, uh, pets in particular are very close to our hearts. Uh, I think almost 
Uh, the majority of households in the United States have at least one pet. Um, and because they do encourage us to go outside and to socialize and get exercise and, you know, they're proven that they can reduce stress and anxiety and depression. So I think there is an association that we have with our pets as part of our families, and they are very much our children and, and we protect them that way. And you look at the medical bills that we'll spend on our animals when they have things. I mean, it's significant, right? But I think it there's a there's an interesting wall between there and anything outside of that, right? How we look at cows, for example, and you know, there might be sacred in India, yet we see them as a food source here, yet we see in other countries where they'll eat what we would consider a pet and we're horrified by that, right? And and part of that comes from uh, cultural differences, uh, famine and other things that have happened in other parts of the world, how their relationship is with animals, um, both good and bad, right? How rats are seen in India, um, yet they can c carry disease as we know and plagues and, and yet um, they are also worshiped. And so I think that it's not just how we per portray them in our media or entertainment, but also how we see them in society. And I think the real problem becomes is if we do encourage those st stereotypes through our stories, like the Jaws idea, then we can turn a blind eye to it if there is a injustice happening to animals outside, like like you know fishermen overfishing the oceans um, or doing something to sharks, you know you know finning, and they're throwing away 99% of the animal. Um, because of its medicinal, you know, worth in certain areas. So I think that's that's the responsibility that goes both ways, right? Not just to vilify or portray them in a good or bad light, um, but also to make sure that responsibility is then given back to the audience afterwards that they understand the impact of what it, that happens in not just culture, but in our as our food supply and for uh, just the planet. And it's funny, I don't know if this is a conscious decision on the part of animators or filmmakers now, but it does feel like there have been good strides made to to sort of not perpetuate the Jaws situation, like through movies like Ratatouille or Wally, to use a couple examples. Um, the rats in Ratatouille are very rat-like. You know, they're not made overly cutesy in the way that they move and and so you know, rats have always been a thing that that people have vilified because they're you know, they're in the sewers and they, they're, they're, I don't know, they're predators, they're this, they're that, um, they're these disgusting creatures. Ratatouille didn't shy away from the way rats move, but yet it sort of made you, I don't know, more understanding of rats or more, I don't know, you sort of regard them more fondly than maybe you did before that. And then that same way of cock cockroaches are this thing that we all just have this visceral reaction to, you know, that the old creep show episode where in the sterile apartment cockroaches end up getting everywhere and now you see this this cockroach in wally and it's cute and it's friendly and it's kind of uh the companion to to wally and i guess for me personally like when i see a cockroach now i don't regard it in the same way and partly because i <laughs> i don't think of it in the same disgusting way that it's been portrayed in past media and so i don't know again i don't know if that's a conscious thing or if it's just a couple of things that have worked on me and made me sort of reconsider the way I've regarded these creatures. Yeah, no, I, I, I can see that. I, I think as a kid, I always wondered if I was going to find, uh, you know, a cricket, you know, that was, uh, you know, wore a little hat and had a cane. and you know, like, <laughs> 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 That's cool. So what, what do you guys think is next in terms of, you know, storytelling, media and technology and kind of, I mean, there's so much, so much going on right now in the industry and, you know, technology has been like this a massive enabler, whether it's, advanced types of animation or streaming or you know, instant, you know, we can have a movie come out in the same day, you can get it on Netflix now, you know, obviously AR and VR are huge in terms of storytelling potential. And I think it's still untapped. Um, you know, wh wh where do you think things are going? Are, are we going to be, be seeing, you know, traditional media still for a long time to come? Or are we kindly, finally kind of at that tipping point now where it's, uh, you know, digital, digital, digital. Well, I think we were at that tipping point before COVID. Uh, you know, you saw the decline in attendance in theaters and you were seeing a rise in streaming, a rise in gaming. And, uh, and with COVID, with everyone, you know, being quarantined and locked down and at home, you saw a huge rise in AR and VR. You saw a huge uptick in streaming, a gigantic boom for the game industry. 
And I think audiences are really looking for more immersive experiences. So the convergence of all this media um, where you're getting entertainment and streaming now combining with interactive media, there's a lot of headlines, you know, Netflix is looking into interactive media after what they had recently with uh, some of their interactive um, projects like on Black Mirror, uh, like Bandersnatch. And so I think you're, you're starting to see that theaters are really trying to be relevant because people are very cautious about coming back and socializing. But the, the truth is even before COVID, you know, my daughter was, you know, she was socialized to go to film, to movie theaters, but she's much more comfortable at home just watching on her iPhone or streaming Netflix. And, you know, the, the, the chore of this next generation to go out, spend the money, uh, you know, fighting with traffic, going to park somewhere, getting into a big room for 90 minutes without using your cell phone and communicating every three seconds with someone else is a challenge, right, for this generation and even our generation. And so I think that's what's changing right now is this agency that we all can have a more immersive experience at our fingertips and yet have three other things going on at the same time. And for those of us who are used to having a true immersive experience where you're in uh, in a theater or in some kind of experience for an hour and a half experiencing that and nothing else. Um, it's hard for a lot of creators to understand that this next generation is not used to that. And that's where VR is kind of an interesting challenge because that does consume your, you know, immersive sort of creative focus. And I think it's just going to be a hybrid of that in the coming years. Chris, we're, we're wrapping down to the last couple of minutes. Do you, um, you want, you want to add on to that and kind of wrap up? Yeah, I mean, the only thing to me that'll be interesting is to see how movie theaters are regarded coming out of COVID. You know, it was like, I think we did all take it for granted or a lot of a lot of TVs are big enough now that the experience was not different enough to warrant seeing everything in theaters other than the big spectacles like superhero movies. Once we've lost that, you know, once it was sort of like, it was no longer a thing that was just available to us at all times. You know, speaking of The Quiet Place yet again, um, the box office was great this past this past weekend, um, and I think it's because people have missed that immersive experience in theaters. And so, it'll be curious to see if going forward, if people sort of hold on to that and remember missing that that kind of communal giant experience that they used to get out of theaters, and if if attendance picks up again. Um, but I certainly think that the AR, VR, XR thing is going to uh, play a bigger and bigger part of the way we tell stories. Cool. Well, well, thank you for that lead in. So uh, one last note, I wanted to give a little shout out to my own team. Uh, we're actually working on something in that vein. We're going to be calling it Meta Pets. Uh, it's going to be, you know, you're kind of a crypto kitties, Tamagotchi combined in AR, but you're also going to be able to take them with you into some VR environments and back and forth. And uh, there's going to be some amazingly cool things that haven't been done before with that. So uh, keep a lookout for that this summer. Uh, and so again, thank you guys so much. It's great seeing you again, Keith and Chris. Uh, yeah, same. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to you for the uh, Word uh, Animal Center for for hosting this. This has been fantastic. So thank you, and I guess we'll turn it back over to Jessica. Hi guys, I loved that panel conversation. Thank you guys so much. Um, all three of you are such incredible, talented, wonderful creators and artists, and it means a lot to us that you understand how incredible animals are and do such a beautiful job with your work portraying them. Um, I want to say that everybody out there can be a superhero. All they have to do is go to the local animal shelter and adopt. We would appreciate it. The animals will appreciate it, and they will give you a lifetime of love. So thank you so much to everyone, Chris, Keith, and Robert. We really adore you, and thanks so much. And we'll see you guys hopefully very soon. Awesome. Thank you.